early days of broadcasting. And what a turnout we had. Marie Torrey, Hank Stoll, Paul Shannon, Don Riggs, Nick Perry, and Josie Carey are just the beginning of a long list of TV friends that you'll see tonight. You know, this was the first time ever that all of these people, myself included, had gathered in one place to talk and laugh and relive those early days. And it really was a blast. One quick note, be sure and be with us next Tuesday night, same time, for more fun on the airwaves with Pittsburgh's original radio stars. Right now, leave your set to us and those golden days of Steel City TV. Pittsburgh's original TV stars is made possible in part by KDKA TV2, WTAE TV, and the contributing members of WQEX. The common bond besides competition is people. KDKA and WTAE take this seriously. We consider this a rare opportunity to combine our efforts to bring fun and good memories to all our viewers. And Benedict has agreed to become a government witness in a larger corruption investigation. Good morning and welcome to Good Day Pittsburgh. My name is Adam Lynch. He took the title from Cuba's Benny Kid Perret in a fight down at Miami Beach. And here is Four Star News with Carl Lyde and Ed Conway. On Gateway to Glamour with Eleanor Shano. Good evening. I'm Hank Stoll. Hi, I'm Jean Conley. Why, hi, how do you do? Why, hi, I'm Jolene. Why, hi, and welcome to Pittsburgh's original TV stars, the first annual reunion, a QEX special. And with us tonight are many of the faces you'd find in this little book. The AFTRA, or American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, Talent Guide for 1956-57. Bill Brandt. Gene Connolly. George Eisenhower. Al McDowell. Dan Mallinger. Nick Perry. Eleanor Shano. Paul Shannon. Hank Stoll. And that's not all. Also with us tonight, Josie Carey, David Krantz, Tom Finn, Adam Lynch, Dave Murray, Joe Negri, Don Riggs, Lucy Seibert, and Marie Torrey. Now, here's our QEX BJ for Saturday night's Remember When Primetime, Ricky Wirtz. Good evening. I'm Ricky Wirtz, and tonight we go back to earlier days in Pittsburgh television, back when KDKA and WTAE had slightly different logos, back when WPXI was known as WIIC. And when's WENS? Well, that was the original Channel 16. And then there was WDTV, affiliated with the old Dumont Network. It was Channel 3 and for many years, the only station in town. Now, can you imagine in this day of cable TV and satellites only one station? Hey, honey, what's on at 9? The Fishing and Hunting Club with Bill Slater. That's it? Well, maybe we read a lot more then. But tonight's program doesn't deal with old stations or old network shows. It's a reunion of just a few of the men and women who made TV in this town. The people who helped shape local news, talk shows, kid shows, and the like. Let's go back in time and meet four of Pittsburgh's original TV stars. TV loved a pretty face, so it seemed a natural home for this fashion model, Eleanor Shano. Her TV career began at WDTV with Bill Burns and a quiz show called Guest to Ghost. She later became Pittsburgh's first weather woman for KDKA, then WTAE. But the pretty face turned out to be a pretty fair street reporter and then news anchor. A lovelier face, a more attractive figure, 
an insight to fashion. All are yours for the asking, as is the Glamour record on Gateway to Glamour with Eleanor Shano. Still, to the rest of the country, Eleanor Shano was the embodiment of glamour. From hats to heels, from a good figure to good phone manners, her Gateway to Glamour was gospel for millions of women. Gateway was a Dan Malinger production. With little in the way of time, money, and glamour, this small crew churned out 390 episodes on film, each five minutes long. The show aired on 112 stations nationwide. Behind the camera, Dan Malinger served as a commercial announcer and narrator-writer for Pit Parade. In front of the camera, he was a news commentator and the SO reporter. In those days, one could do a little of everything, and Dan Malinger did. On the other hand, Jean Conley kept pretty much in front of the camera. In fact, she was on the air longer and more often than any woman in Pittsburgh. Her home edition carried over from the Dumont station to KDKA. Later, it was the Jean Connolly show on Channel 4. And if they passed through Pittsburgh, anybody who was anybody paid Jean a visit. And I'm happy to say that uh, I did uh, very good business in all these places. But why do you feel that this is the right time to uh, make only guest appearances? <clears throat> well, I have been on for three years, mm -hmm. and uh, being on every week, you, you have the danger of being overexposed on television, and people do get very tired of you. Uh, you see, show business is a sideline with me. Mm -hmm. I'm the Bob Prince of show business. <laughs> I know much more about sports than I do about show business. It's wonderful to grow mentally, spiritually, and just to grow up. You know, most people are afraid of growing up. And they... She talked to the stars, but Jean Conley still seemed like one of the ladies, the neighbor who served lemonade to all the kids after softball. Standing in for Carlyde with the headlines. The in turn, newscaster Dave Murray seemed like one of the guys. And unlike so many anchors since, he cared more for news and far less for the camera's eye. Murray also started at WDTV then was lured away to WENS. But when the city's original Channel 16 folded, Dave Murray journeyed to Minneapolis, then back to Pittsburgh and WTAE. There he found a home as a program director, news director, and co-anchor with John B. Hughes. And just remember, Pittsburgh's first on-camera newscaster wasn't Hughes, or Carl Lyde, or even Bill Burns. It was... Dave Murray. The uncompleted structure today, it was a pretty cold and lonely... We're live in the QEX studio in beautiful downtown Oakland. <laughs> in our studio, we have all the stars assembled, and most of them you see over in our peanut gallery. The rest are here with me. Now, throughout the evening, we'll play musical chairs, and we'll have the Philip Morris usherettes on hand to catch off-the-cuff comments. Also in our studio are the families and friends of the stars. Now, you, the viewer, will also have an opportunity to participate. You can call us with questions for the stars. Our number is 621 7161. Operators are standing by to take your questions, so please give them your name, address, phone number, and the question. <laughs> and even if we can't put your call on the air, we'll attempt to answer your questions as soon as possible. Now let's meet our first group of original Pittsburgh television stars. And I have to start with our first 11 o'clock anchor news person in the city of Pittsburgh. And of course, that was you, David Murray. And David has always been very concise with the news that he gave and when he talks to everybody and I warned him that if he said to me good luck good news and what is it good night good luck and good news tomorrow uh close close what was it <laughs> good. time's up so time's goes time's up news. so it goes this is good night good luck and good news time's up what a voice uh David a lot of the people wonder okay you went over to TAE were you on the air there very long uh to uh you mean to Channel 4? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, off and on, though, Ricky. I was a program manager and uh, news director and uh, newscaster for a while. And uh, it was one of those cases where I really just walked down the hall 
and uh, did a job I had done earlier on the old WDTV Channel 3. Now that was back in when you first did the Anchor News. That was 52? Uh, early 52, right. I got to uh, DTV in October, I believe, of 51, and the uh, 11 o'clock uh, news went on uh, that following January or maybe February. Ray Scott and I did it together. That must have been nice not having competition. <laughs> oh. Well, I think, I think all of us who are uh, sitting here have no illusions at all about the fact that uh, uh, there was one station in town and one station only. Uh, we were the only game in town, and uh, it was just tremendous uh, from our standpoint, as far as competition goes. There was none, right, Gene? There was no competition. There was no other television until late in the day, actually. Which is one reason I think we can account for so many live local shows as they were gradually added. Because where we had the choice of the networks, the better programs from CBS, NBC, and of course Dumont, we had nothing until, what, that afternoon show started, about three o'clock in the afternoon. But before that, we had to fill in with local programs which ran back to back to back to back to back without... In the same studio? Yeah. Yes, from, from one side to the next to the next. Live commercials, maybe 30 seconds between shows. Well, Dan, that? what were you? Then you were the announcer, and you did four pit news. I did uh, pit parade. Pit parade. And then I became the SO reporter. That was oh, an old WDTV. Yes, the SO reporter. And, uh, of course, there was no SO anymore. <laughs> But uh, when the that's show business. But, but anyway, we won't hold you responsible, Dan. Thanks. But no, she's right. You would start in the studio, and we would shoot all four walls, as they would say. Uh, there would be a live show every 15 minutes or every half hour, in some instances, every five minutes. And there would be a 30-second break between shows where they would go to a film commercial. And uh, the cameras would start, let's say, here on this left wall, and by the two or three hours were up, they would go all the way around the studio on our flats, we you know, little gray flats. It was black and white, didn't make any difference. Hang a picture on the back, and that was it. And we just started at like four o'clock in the afternoon, and it went like that until you hit the network again, maybe at eight o'clock. It was all local live, everything. That was one of the things that was interesting that's changed too, I think, Ricky, in that a lot of the programs were five minutes or 10, or 15 minutes at oh, the most, but okay. uh, none of this half hour or one hour business oh, until you hit the network late at night. Dave and I were reminiscing about that earlier. I remember at Channel 4 when you were news director, Dave, and, and we went from a 15 minute newscast, you had 10 minutes of news, you had sports, weather, and then take four, and the word came down that we were going to do a half hour of news, and everyone kind of looked stunned and said, how can we ever fill a half hour? We heard from our peanut gallery. Juana Dawn is here tonight. <laughs> Ricky, talking about sponsors that no longer exist, the first sponsor of the uh, 11 o'clock news on DTV was the Fort Pitt Brewing Company, and later the Duquesne Brewing Company. <laughs> bit in the dust. <laughs> How many live beer commercials where, you know, you had to pour the beer on camera? Oh, yes. How many of us oh, had uh, suds yes. down the front of our feet? <laughs> I, I, I never can't. did one. I'm kind of sorry. <laughs> I still can't do it. But that was a trick to get it so that the foam never spilled over the sides but went up over the top of the glass. Yeah, they used and to put some salt around live. the edge. Yes. Anything I have to, to tell Dan going. a story that I've never told him until this moment. Ooh, this goes back. Uh, this goes go. back to. It's a little later. <laughs> goes back to the early '50s, and I was a, an undergraduate at Duquesne, and I was sent down one day to do a commercial to package programs, a commercial that was going to run in Pit Parade. Yeah. And I walked up the stairs, and there is a man with his shirt sleeves rolled up, and he's typing. And Dan Malinger, you became my role model. It was then that oh, I decided that I was hell. going to be a newscaster. <laughs> but I wasn't smart enough to realize then that I was a woman and that there was no place in television news for a woman. And it took a lot of years before that changed. Yeah, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. You and I, down the line, put together that gateway to Glamour show. So 390 five-minute shows in five months. Say it again. 
five months, we did 395 five-minute television shows. And I had a baby a year and a half at home. <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. No. <laughs> Let's get that straight. No, no, but I mean, you know, I'm just... My wife is out there. Your husband is out there. <laughs> how, how did we do it, Dan? Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we would film all day long. Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we would edit the film. And while I was editing with the editors, uh, you would be working on scripts. And then on Sunday, we used to check out all the scripts and get all the props we needed for Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And that went on for five months. Now, you may ask, why did we do that? Money. <laughs> <laughs> why, why? Remember that we did a pilot. We had a meeting in your yeah. living room. We did a pilot. We did a pilot, happened? and we gave it to this fella, Ken Israel, to go out and sell it. And he called me, oh, it took months. And he called me one day from Detroit and said, I made the first sale. And I said, that's great. He says, it starts in two weeks in Detroit. And we had one show. That was the 15-minute pilot that he had in his briefcase. And we had to come up with five shows for the first week within two weeks. We started the next morning. And I think we were shooting six shows a week in order to keep ahead with the promise that nobody would get sick or die until we got done with the series. Fortunately, nobody got sick, nobody died, and we finished the series, and that was the beginning of it. And I was working at Channel 4 yeah. at the time, and Channel 11 ended up buying the, the show. series. Well, Ricky, I have to tell you a story. If that was the first one for money, I think maybe Nick Perry and I lay claim to the first dramatic production on oh. Dumont. All right. And it was so much fun because there's no record of this whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it was not recorded. It was not logged. There were not 16 carbons of it. On Monday nights, when Channel 3 was still working out of the transmitter on Perrysville Avenue, before Dumont had studios, we did a movie on Monday nights called The Eleventh Hour that opened with a slide of a tower and a bats flying across a full moon and that sort of thing. Well, we decided that that wasn't very exciting to just have this slide and some music and Nick saying, this is the 11th hour. So we had our dramatic production. Nick opened the show with the squeaky music and the squeaky door, and he's saying, this is the 11th hour. And Joe Missick, who was our chief engineer, slammed a two-by-four on the table, and I screamed. And that was the opening of the show. Then we all went home. <laughs> You're so creative. <laughs> I don't I think the station it. manager even knew we did that every Monday night. <laughs> you did it live that way every Monday night? Oh, of, of course. course. You think there was tape? Well, no, there wasn't tape, but I mean, you, you didn't record that little thing. You came in and you screamed oh, no, every no, night. No, we, we were there because that was the end of the shift, anyhow. The engineers took over. You, you know, you know what, what was beautiful about the whole thing? Yeah. <laughs> That's why she screamed. Dave Grant said he hit her with a two-by-four. You know, what was really great about the whole thing, I think, is when we all first started, uh, we were all real young. Seriously, now. We're all young. Oh, yeah, yes, it's still. Yes. We were younger, all young. Much younger. Most of us weren't married. Uh, it was a brand new industry. And honestly, nobody thought of themselves as a star. I mean, I think that's a misnomer in the title of the show, mm -hmm. really. When you talk to all these people, none of us thought of, you weren't a star. But you became one. No, yeah. no. You no. Said nobody more. did. I, I don't think that was in anybody's uh -huh. mind. Well, and we, we didn't worry. You were. To the we just people. had a lot of fun. Nobody yeah. made any real money. You know, uh, everybody just had a lot of fun. Yeah. But I think the, the great thing is you established a norm that then became what followed because you were the first to do it. That's true. You were the first to do it. I was talking to Marv Jacobson and he said when you do a commercial, it was like, well, let's try it because nobody ever did <laughs> exactly. it. Exactly. It was like, could we do it? Well, let's try yeah, it. Try. And we tried it and then the next thing you knew, that was the norm that was established from then on. Oh, yeah. That, that was exciting. Speaking of Marv, he did some real kooky commercials, I'll tell you <laughs> Well, that. it just fits his personality there, you know that. He hasn't changed, I saw him outside. Yes, he and Phyllis are here tonight. And there were no teleprompters. You, no. You mem it's amazing cue the things cards. we memorized. And cue cards. Well, we didn't always, I'll tell you that. Because the worst moment, and I still have nightmares about it, was doing an Amana freezer commercial in the Chamber of Commerce building, which was to be 60 seconds long 
And of course it was live, no cue cards, no teleprompter, in the middle of showbiz quiz, I think, or maybe it was guest to ghost. And Art Brown, with whom I worked on the home edition show, was such a marvelous memorizer. He could memorize the, <laughs> I, I don't know, six pages of a cereal box and read it right back to you. And I thought, well, if Art Brown can do it, I can do it too. And I rehearsed it, and I, I knew this down pat. And I got on the air and lost myself about the third line. And of course, no one knew what to do. They just hung there. And your stand, well, it was worse than what happened to Betty Furness with the refrigerator door that wouldn't open. My mouth wouldn't open. <laughs> and finally, someone had the sense to go to black because that's all you could do. To this day, I, I break out in a cold sweat thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's awful. Back to uh, how you poured the beer and make it uh, stop at the very end. I don't know why somebody didn't figure out earlier, why don't you just film it? It'll stop at the same place every night, you know, but we did it live anyway. And if you recall, uh, announcers in those days were uh, allowed to drink beer on television. And uh, Ray Scott and I uh, did the 11 o'clock news and he got to do the commercial. Now they had to rehearse these commercials. And uh, Ray, I don't want to ever say Ray was anything but perfectly sober on the air, but they did have to call a halt to the rehearsal somewhere along the line. <coughs> the guy in the ad agency up in the control room would say, do it again, Ray. Well, had he done it too many times, we wouldn't have had any sports that night. They uh, banned that old years ago. Well, back at that same year, Carl I was there. Oh, yeah. Carl, Carl was, was part of it. We have a, a tape of Carl that you, you, our viewers might enjoy seeing uh, to bring back some fond memories of a yeah. good buddy of ours. Sure. And uh, I think, well, now Carl was DTV as well as KD, and then he came. He came to Channel he, 4. Yeah. Then he came right. over to TAE. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was a tragic day out in Greeley, yeah, Colorado. Colorado. The crew cut Texas was very Christmas big in those days. Oh, yeah. He, he was known for his crew cut. Now, school, he had a problem no with classes. a detached retina, yes, right? And then yeah. near the uh, latter part of his life, he wore a, a patch black patch. Mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that was so distinguished. I did, too. Didn't you think He should have done it years before. I know. It just gave him such a dash. If he would have been the first one, he could have posed for shirt ads, too. That's right. There was a whole lot of money to be made there. Hathaway, Schweppes, he could have made a fortune yeah, if he'd he done that He began it. Again, yeah. we established the Norman Pittsburgh. See that? Right. Well, we had another buddy of his and yours was Ed Conway. Yeah. And when did Ed come? Does anybody remember when Ed arrived in town? He actually came to uh, WIIC when they went on the air in 19, right. that would have been 1958. Mm -hmm. Uh, 57? With the original 57, 57 yeah. Mark Schaefer, Bob Cochran, with shooting his um, -year -old son Ronald. Bill, Bill Cardell, yeah. and Ed with the first one. And then he moved over to Channel 4. Uh, our manager at the time, Frank Snyder, was uh, fascinated by the fact that Ed flew all the way to Argentina to get an interview with Earl Bell. Some of you might remember that story. And he said, any guy that'll work like that, you know, deserves a job over here. So we came over. Eventually ended up doing mostly sports, however. Right. And real good. Yes. So. He was he's good a great favorite, too, with, with everyone in the sports world. Oh, yeah. Well, again, I go back to how dashing. I was impressed by all the men. Have you noticed? But he had the widow's peak. And the women all loved that widow's peak. They came down, and he'd stare at you on camera with that dark peak sticking down there. And oh, my. I think every woman in Pittsburgh's heart fluttered. Dave and I used to have widow's peaks. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Dan. One thing I have to share with they everybody never did. is. <laughs> never. Well, one thing I have to share with them about you, Dan Mallinger, is Dan left being on camera to go behind the scenes with AFTRA. When, well, did, you, yeah. when did you join AFTRA? Well, I was president of AFTRA in 1960, and then in 64, our executive secretary at that time, a fellow by the name of Dylan Hirsch, passed away. And uh, they asked me if I would be the executive secretary part-time because I was still doing some on-air work. And uh, that lasted for a year or two part-time and then it just got to be too much. And I also started to feel that it wasn't fair or it wasn't right for me to be doing the same work that I was representing people doing. There could right. very well be a conflict of interest. So I went full-time with AFTRA and that's been almost 25 years now. Well, management throughout the city 
They've recognizes changed. you. You've seen them all. But could you show them your after furrowed brow? That oh, we no, all I know? wouldn't do that. Oh, look at that after furrow brow. Is that beautiful? He would just furrow those brows and get our contract signed. Yeah. Sure. I wish <laughs> and it would we only been so it. easy. <laughs> no, it was a long struggle. Yeah. When did the strike take place, guys? 1961. 60. The big was one 60? was 1960. <clears throat> Valentine's Day. It was no, cold. No, no, it was no. very cold. That was the first time I met Buona Dawn. Uh, Katie, we had a strike at KDKA Radio and Television, uh, and uh, the mm -hmm. first morning, it was snowing, it was almost zero, and we were down there at Gateway Center, and up comes this guy. I didn't know who he was, and he said, I'm supposed to go to work here today. And I said, what's your name? And he says, I'm Don Riggs. I said, give him a picket sign. <laughs> that, was his, that was his introduction to the first welcome, day at work. Welcome to After. Well, George Eisenhower, you were, you were there that same time. I happened to be president of the union at that That's time. Right. Oh, you yes. were the president yes. during that. That's yes. right. And I still have yeah. the scars on my back. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first, first, see, I, have, I can't help but do this. I'm sorry. It's just an announcer. Anyway, the strike lasted three weeks. It was in <laughs> below, zero, <laughs> below zero weather. I don't think it went above 10 degrees at the whole oh, time. Wow. And I defy anybody in this room to tell me what that strike was about. <laughs> Including me, George. Booth announcer. Booth what about booth no, announcers, really, George? Uh, <laughs> it was really about videotape. Was it, it really, In 1961? The, the key to the whole strike, I mean, there were a lot of minor issues, but the key to the whole strike was the fact that videotape was coming in. And we wanted to know what protection we would have because we were all scared to death of losing our jobs. Everything we had ever done in our lives was, was live. And here they come with videotape and we wanted some protection for videotape. And that was basically what the whole strike was about. Did we get it? Yeah. Okay. Oh, we didn't know that. Uh, you want to see the cross the talk? I'm also on a And uh, let's take one of our callers on the air. You're on the air. Hello. Can I have your question? Hello, Ricky. Yes. Here's what I want to know. Did you used to have a tree stump on your show that you used to pull things out of? Yes, I did. It was the magic tree stump, and I used to lift it up. And do you know, it looked an awful lot like something that you would find in lavatories. And I would lift it up, and it got to be a terrible joke at the studio. But inside it were all of my commercial props, and I would bring the magic commercial out. And oh. that's why I did. You did remember. Oh, yeah. I have a feeling I know how old you are. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Thank you for okay. calling in. Is that where you brought the jokes from also? No, I had a joke box, but oh. I got into a lot of trouble with that joke box. I used the joke box to fill time, and uh, some teenage boy sent me jokes that I didn't always screen <laughs> closely enough, <laughs> and I'd get in trouble. And sometimes I really didn't recognize those words, because I hadn't been exposed to teenagers at that point in my life. Uh-huh. Okay, we're going to Bethel Park. Hi, Bethel Park. You're on the air. Yes. My question is uh, a little bit apart from the Pittsburgh doing area, from the Pittsburgh stations at any rate, but whatever happened to Marshall Fatkin, that little fellow who, complete with malaprops, gave the weather on the Steubenville Channel for Ohio Power Company? I always felt he must have been a brother-in-law. I don't know. He thought you, you thought he was Marshall your brother-in-law. I'm sorry, I don't think anybody, any, hey, a peanut gallery. No, everybody's kind of shaking their heads. They didn't know. Okay, we've got a call. For, sorry, none of us can fill you in on that one. Brookline is on the air now. Yes. Hi, Ricky. Hi. It's great to see you. Thank you. I'm Jerry Dorn's widow, and you and many of your guests recorded for him for industrial shows many a year ago. Remember, Jerry, he did the original stereo broadcast in Pittsburgh. Okay, sure. And... Uh, Sterling Yates was one of the recording art artists, and I wondered if anyone knows what happened to him after he went to New yeah, York. Yeah, I think some of us have been in we touch with Sterling. Did Hank, anybody yeah. want to... Hank, Hank, Hank talk have you him, been in you? touch with Sterling? Yes, uh, about three or four years I talked to Sterling. Uh, the person who would tell you more about Sterling right now is the writer for the Pittsburgh Magazine, Tim Zayakis, who just did an article about... Uh, children personalities here in Pittsburgh would know more about anybody. I last talked to him about three years ago. Okay. I'm sure there's an update. Is okay, he well? he's fine. By the way, Ricky. Yeah? Uh, one of my youngsters was on your show 
And she just reminded me of one of the jokes she told. <laughs> All right. Was it one of the good ones? Oh, yes, she was. Oh, she's very a fine <laughs> young child. Yes. She said, why did you throw the butter out oh, of the Oh, come way? on. Oh. Oh. <laughs> One of the great she, ones. Oh, that's one of the great ones. <laughs> right. You tell her. That was our favorite joke. You bet. Uh, I forget the answer. Uh, no. There, there we go. What was the, what was the point?